Welcome everyone to the Interstate Batteries Pro Clinic webinar on troubleshooting electrical systems. We'll begin in just a minute as we wait for a few more folks to join us. Uh, in the meantime, uh, if you're logged in to Zoom, which you are if you're seeing this, you'll see a little toolbar either at the bottom or top of your window. If you would go to that, put your mouse over it, scroll over it, you'll see a button that says Q&A. Go ahead and open that window up. And if you have questions throughout the webinar at any time, please put those in there. Um, we will do our best to answer them during the webinar. And if we can't, we will have people, uh, we will take some time at the end of it to answer those questions um, you know, live. So uh, go ahead and put those in at any time. They do help us make better content and make this a better experience for everybody that's, that's on here today. So it's like we have about 130 folks already on here. That's good. Um, just want to remind you also this webinar will be recorded. So if you miss part of it, you'll have a link after the presentation uh, that will be sent to the email you used to register for it. Uh, also, if you registered for this one, hopefully you'll receive emails for future webinars, but you can always go to interstatebatteries.com slash proclinic and you'll be able to see um, uh, past webinars that are available on YouTube, or you'll, you'll see more recent webinars. You'll, you'll still need to go to Zoom and register for those if you haven't already. But go to interstatebatteries.com slash proclinic. We put uh, training videos up there as well as proclinics. Um, just battery 101, how to talk to customers, testing, charging, AGM batteries. There's lots of content there that we make free um, for you uh, to, to grow and, and for us to have an impact on your business. So. With that said, um, let's go ahead and kick it off. I want to introduce our hosts for this one. Um, and first, I'll go through our, our agenda. We, as I mentioned, this is troubleshooting electrical systems. This comes from our ProClinic manual, which was created by Gail and Jeff. Um, we're going to talk about some fundamentals of, of troubleshooting. This is stuff you need to, you can apply to troubleshooting all kinds of problems, but today we're going to be applying it to electrical talk about voltage and grounds, uh, voltage drops, resistance. And at the end, we're going to have a, a short pop quiz, a one, one question pop quiz. Uh, and that will be followed by a survey, five questions. We ask everybody, if you please fill that out, it would really help us keep doing these. Uh, and one, one person who fills out the survey is going to win a, a mini helmet autographed by Kyle Bush of the Joe Gibbs Racing Team. So. Uh, let me more properly introduce our hosts now, uh, Gail Kimbrough and Jeff together, uh, uh, Jeff Barron, between the two of them, they have almost a century of working in the automotive and battery industry. Both have multiple certifications during their careers. Um, Jeff and Gail have written and published articles for trucking magazines and automotive world. They helped develop interstate batteries testing lab. Um, you know, if you've, if you've had ever had supply issues, you know, interstate, the way we try to help avoid having supply issues is we work with multiple manufacturers and because we have this lab we can test every one of those batteries to make sure that they are um, you know this up to the standards that we want them to be so you're going to have batteries and they're going to be good and um, both of them have a passion for helping others gain knowledge and have a better understanding of the technical side of the business. Um, Jeff, Gail, thank you for again for doing these uh, doing these with us and joining us today. Oh thank you guys welcome. Oh, thank you. Thank you all very much. And Good to be here. Gail, would you like to introduce our other host? Yes, George Ohm. Uh, he and I were about the same age. Actually, uh, you know, one of the things about George Ohm that we're going to introduce a little bit later on is that he created an electrical law, not a theoretical principle, but an, an electrical law that we're going to talk about a little bit later on. So he's just a touch older than I am. Just a little bit. Like you were in there for photography, but not by much. <laughs> <laughs> Next time we'll have you illustrated for, for your introductory slide. Yeah, he and I don't have the same hairdo. No, no. All right. Well, let's jump in. Uh, we're going to, Jeff, you want to start us off with just talking about overall principles of troubleshooting? You bet you. We sure will. So let's kind of break it down with all the aspects or uh, aspects of the process or parts as we would be looking at. So when you uh, when you start with a visual, you know you raise the hood, kind of do a glance at everything that you can see in there. Uh, is it still got all the belts on there that are supposed to be there? Are there you know wires that are frayed? Uh, hopefully you guys have never encountered one that's like uh, up on the upper right hand side picture. Um, 
that's probably not a really good connection for, uh, you know, making sure that you've got availability for current to flow. Uh, if you see anything like that, just please close the hood and uh, send them on their way because you're probably going to get into more than uh, what you really wanted to do. So let's let's try to figure out the uh, the vehicle's history. You know, who worked on it last? Uh, when did the problems actually start? Uh, you know, heaven forbid it hasn't come from a body shop because uh, that could be a dead indicator of a lot of different things. So just kind of get the history behind it. It's best to know everything up front rather than to have to go back to the customer and keep asking over and over, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? So just kind of make sure you're getting the, uh, the whole story once you get the vehicle in there. And just, you know, start with the simplest, you know, look at the trouble codes. Now they're going to get you pointed in a direction, but they won't always point you to the failure. Uh, you know, you got a P303 code in there. Well, we know it's a misfire, but you know, what's causing this fire? So, you know, like I said, you can get trouble codes to get you in a starting direction, but we want to make sure that we're actually going to get this car fixed and fixed right the first time. So just get every valid information you can and just start looking and, and figure out exactly what's going on with it. A little Look at hard fault, soft fault codes. I mean, anything that uh, is going to help you get going in the right direction and not doing all kind of unnecessary work. So, you know, once again, leads all back to getting the history and the information direct uh, right up front before you get started on it. A little Sherlock Holmes work, so. Exactly. And if you think the problem may be electrical, you want to look for voltage drops. I guess that's where we'll start. That's that, where Gail. we're going to start. Gail, yeah. Gail, go ahead. No, you go, go ahead, Gail. You're I don't up. know that I'm talking about. Okay, when we talk about voltage drops, we're talking about the energy that's lost in a circuit or component when the current pass, passes through that resistance factor that's in both of those types of situations or all of those. So normal voltage drops uh, in anything that we have current, if we have current and voltage and we have resistance, so there's gonna be some type of voltage drop. And we're gonna to talk today about unwanted voltage drops. Uh, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about now. All of you have been on a freeway, let's say three, four, five lanes on each side, and two or three of those lanes get taken up because somebody decided to cover all three, four lanes and, and exit right there and had a wreck. And so now the police come out and now we have these three or four, five lanes down to one or two. And so all of this all of these vehicles are trying to go through that one or two lanes and it causes a lot of friction and resistance between drivers. Well, that's very similar to what we, if we consider that in a cable type situation or component, we have that resistance factor when things don't have a full level of capability of flowing through that cable or, and so we, we have a situation where it goes into a very small place and causes a lot of, due to corrosion, connection, all these different things. And just like Jeff said, we follow those codes and we know all the different codes for the different vehicles possibly, and it leads us in a direction, but we also have to be troubleshooters. And this is what we're gonna talk about today, getting down to the fundamentals of electrical troubleshooting, and that includes voltage drops. Now. The Society of Automotive Engineers, SAE, has recommended voltage drops. So that's a good place to start because we need to know what the criteria is for the voltage drops. What's, what's the maximum voltage drops that we should see in a, in a circuit? And so this is a situation of voltage on the left and the wire gauge, obviously, and the amount of current and then the component, uh, various types of components. So for example, nine hundredths of a vote to one tenth of a vote uh, in a small computer connection, low current accessories, et cetera, one to two tenths of a vote on small 20 to 100 current levels of alternators, high current accessories, two tenths of a vote for battery starter cables and or three tenths of a vote, depending on the size, the amount of current that's going through it, heavy duty switches, solenoid starters, that go, et cetera. And we're gonna talk about a great deal of that. So now we've got the, the criteria 
established uh, that the SAE recommended voted drops are so that we can then look at this and know if it's above that, we have a problem, a potential problem. And we're gonna go through the methodology now and talk about how to do some of these things and look at some of the voltage drop measurements and the criteria for going through that. So when we talk about voltage drops, that again is a loss of voltage through a, a cable connection component due to a uh, resistance factor. And so we're gonna look at Ohm's law, George Ohm's law. And he says that intensity or current times resistance always, always equals voltage. So that as an example, if we have a small amount of current, one amp, and we could achieve a zero resistant cable or connection, which you can't, but let's for criteria here for this, uh, we can talk about having zero. So we would have no zero, no voltage drop. Even if we had a higher amp level of hundred amps and we could achieve zero ohms resistance, we would always have zero loss between. That means if you had 14 volts at your battery, you would have 14 volts at your alternator or at your uh, component. So that would be no loss, but that's not reality. Reality is that you're always gonna have some amount of resistance within the cable connection and or component. That's reality. So we have to look at it from a realistic scenario and small and show that small amount of current or resistance can lead to a lot of, a great deal of, of voltage loss within the system. If we take a small amount of current as we illustrated at the top and formula, and we say one amp current now times one ohm of resistance, we have one volt drop. Well, that's a small, very, very small amount of current. Uh, but if we look at it realistically in a starting type situation, uh, 200 amps and we have 100 of an ohm. Now that's a small amount of resistance, isn't it? So if we have 200 amps because we've increased the amount of current going through that cable and only 100 of an ohm resistance, we have two volts drop. What that means in reality is that we have, let's say we have 12 volts at the battery. That means that we've lost two volts. We have 10 volts possibly at the solenoid or and or whatever we're going to at that point. And the same way, if we increase the resistance to two, now we've got four volts drop. Now we're in a situation of, of that starter motor grunting when it tries to turn over. So we have a situation of four volts drop. So you can tell that a small amount, very small amount of minute amount of current of resistance of one hundredth of an ohm can cause in high current situations can cause a lot of voltage loss within the system. So remember this formula, I intensity times resistance always equals E, which is considered electromotive force slash voltage in this situation. We're used to just calling it voltage and we're not used to calling it I intensity maybe, but so we could change the formula in our mind to C times R equals V voltage if you wanted to. But George came up with intensity times resistance equals voltage drop. And if you don't want to have to memorize the formula, I don't know any formulas. Uh, Again, you can fill out our survey at the end of this. And one of the questions is, would you like a copy of this presentation? So we'll send you a PDF of this so you, uh, for future reference. But thank You're you. You're exactly George. right. You're exactly right. Thank you. All right. Jeff, you want to talk to us about the causes of voltage drops? I sure will. So you can also have some of these excessive current draws, but they could also be normal. The things you got to look out for are, you know, your partially shorted starter windings or possibly engine problems, which really causes issues when you're trying to start. Um, could be the oil viscosity. So remember, as the temperatures get cold, um, you know, typically not here in Texas, except when you get the, you know, the snowmageddon. But when the temperatures start dropping, the oil viscosity is actually going to get heavier, thicker. So when these things, when the engine's trying to spin over, if there are other issues, well, then you're going to have a problem trying to get this vehicle started, even if you do have a good battery. 
So the reduced battery efficiency at zero degrees, you're only going to be about 40% efficient. So that's where the CCA values really come into play when you're looking at a battery itself. So just keep that in mind. I mean, you've got normal draws and drains, uh, but you can have issues with either the starters or, you know, internal engine component issues. So just look at some of the obvious things and let's go in from there. You can use a, a clamp on inductive amp meter to try to figure out exactly what alternator output is, or even looking at what the, uh, what it's taken to actually spin that engine over. I mean, if this thing is, uh, has got some internal engine problems, I mean, this thing may be trying to put out 700 amps to spin that starter and it may not be able to do it. Let's see so, what that uh, cam meter test looks like on a pretty healthy engine. Well, sure. Let's roll that beautiful. Who's this handsome footage. man in the pleated khaki shirt? Okay, so what we're gonna do now is actually look at the amperage draw once we crank the vehicle up to see exactly how much amperage it takes for this car to spin over to actually get it to start. Ray, you wanna go ahead and turn it over? Was that 254? And right now, with the loads that Ray's got on, the alternator's only having to push out about nine amps. Ray, turn on some of your loads. Turn your AC on high. So you saw that actually ramped up there really high. What's gonna happen is the alternator is actually gonna ramp up on the voltage side as well to offset and keep the amperage a little bit lower. So it's kind of stabilized now. So we're looking at 2.0, 2.5, somewhere in that neighborhood that we're actually bouncing around just on the load demand. Cool and um, nice job there, Jeff. But also wanna remind everybody we haven't had many questions, so feel free to put those in. The one question I do want to answer for everybody on this call, because I imagine most of us have heard it say it, what's the question we get every single time, Jeff? What are you talking about, concrete? Yep. Well, can you set a battery on concrete? Can you? Well, of course. Yes, you can. Years ago, uh, and when we say years ago, this is back when Gail and I were young, uh, back in the uh, 50s, 60s, and early 70s, the, the way the batteries were actually built with a type of plastic, if you actually set the battery on concrete, it actually could, the minerals and everything in there could actually pull from the battery itself. But as I've always told Gail, you know, now that I know that there's a difference in the, the poly that these batteries are built on, which actually kind of inhibits, you know, anything from being pulled from it from the concrete, if my grandfather still said to this day, put a board down before you set that battery on top of it, I would do that because I respect my grandfather. But so, it won't hurt the yeah. battery. However, OSHA and EPA may have a problem with it, right? Yeah, yeah, they probably, you know, frown on that. Now, frown I will tell that. you that dirt, grease, and grime on top of a battery will actually uh, pull voltage from it. It's not amperage, but it'll pull voltage, just so you guys will know. That's why we've always preached making sure your, your battery is nice, pretty, and clean. I did not know that. All right. Well, we got that question at 11.03. So that, that came in really quick, but thank you for asking. Awesome. Um, another question that just came in says, why is the tester on the negative cable? Well, you can put it on either one. All it's going to do is just flip the, uh, uh, the numbers. It'll be negative. Okay. Thank you, Stephen, for that question. Hey. Again, guys, op open the Q&A uh, tool in your, in your Zoom toolbar if you have a question. Feel free to ask away. All right, Gail, you're up. Okay, some of the causes, thank you, Jeff, for showing that on the starter and, and the different things that could affect it. Uh, and some of the causes that we look at, let's look at this cable, for example. Now, let's say that you could look inside this cable and see the broken strands. You would know automatically you have a problem, but you can't see that because of the hard rubber around it, surrounding it, but there may be corrosion, there may be and there may be broken strands in this type of situation. You can't see it, but it's there. And so, we, again, it's very much like that freeway. All the lanes come down to one or two, and all the current that you're trying to put through there has to go through those one or two uh, strands of, of copper. And so in that situation, that's a very bad situation to have, but we can't see it. And the same thing happens, especially on the negative side. Jeff and I have been in the automotive industry for a long period of time. And probably one of the biggest things that we have faced when you go to codes and you and the code 
you change out parts and it won't fix it, won't repair that problem. And then you have to start looking for the actual problem. One of the things that hits us very strongly is looking at grounds because grounds can cause more problems because of uh, corrosion and you can't see it. So a lot of times on the ground side, they cause those mystery problems and those mystery problems that come up intermittently and I often say that intermittently was for, for was was the word created for technicians a long time ago. Anyway, and so in this situation, these problems are created and come through there being corrosion connections, etc. Surface chemical corrosion, salt, moisture, etc. So those things are those are some of the causes of the voltage drops that we face. On, or encounter on a regular basis. So those are things to look out for. And we're gonna cover those more in depth using that same George Ohm formula here in just a moment or two then and talk about that. So again, look for those because you've, you've already gone through the codes. They led you in a direction. You've replaced or checked that component and it's doing well or showing to be good and then You've got to start going back to the fundamentals. And so remember the voltage drops. Very, very key to, to looking for electrical problems. So how do we get to this and how do we troubleshoot electrical systems? Where do we look for them and how do we look for them? Well, obviously taking a digital multimeter or voltmeter, whichever one you want to call it, take it and put it on your DC scale a DC volt setting and two to 20 volt scale on your meter. Now, some of those might be self-adjusting, whatever meters, but if I were to place this as it illustrates on the side here on the right side, and I'm testing continuity, I test continuity between on little cables and connections a lot of times, is this the right connection or wire that I'm looking for, the green with the, with a yellow strand on it. And so I'm looking for that. So I check continuity and continuity can come in very well in certain situations, but we also need to look for voltage drops. And so I can have good continuity as it shows on this exploded view with, with just with one strand left within that starting cable, guess what? It's gonna show continuity if I put it on resistance. but that's not a good cable, obviously. We can see that because we have the exploded view. Uh, we try not to use exploded, uh, uh, the word exploded around batteries. But anyway, we can use it in, in when we're talking about cables and connections. So anyway, testing cables and wires, test the metal, not the coating. Leave, uh, do not take your digital voltmeter and plug it into a wire or cable itself. Go to the metal because this is a situation where we talk about woodpecker tracks. That means we have placed our cable end into that, the sharp end into that cable, and that's gonna cause an eventual corrosion problem that you're gonna to have to work with later on at some point in that, on that vehicle. So we don't wanna create that. And so, testing that damaged cable if you're doing it by resistance, reiterating alone will not show it. So let's go into a dynamic use of this digital multimeter. We've got it on voltage on the two to 20 volt scale. We're on a live circuit here. And this situation in actuality, we're going to the positive post. Now remember, we're doing that for a reason because we're not testing it at the outside cable yet. We're testing it from the positive post, battery post, all the way to the connection of the starter solenoid. And we're doing this, this is a live type situation because what we're gonna do is we're going to start the vehicle. Remember the formula, I times R equals Z. So I, we've got to have current flowing. That means we've got to have it in the dynamic use. And so in actuality, the way we normally have a situation like that is to place it under a load of current, times resistance is always gonna equal that voltage drop. So in this case, you see that we have 1.8 volts dropped between these when we try to start the vehicle. 
obviously that's a no-go type situation. We know that there's a tremendous loss of voltage in this case. That means that if we had 12 volts at the battery, we have what, 10, two at, at that connection to the starter solenoid. We don't, we can't afford to lose almost two volts between those two. So this is testing wires, cables, testing the metal, not the coating, test testing with a vehicle running and on and and making sure we're going through the actual operation it is conditioned for and that cable is for so as we look at that and we go forward as an example we've got a cable here that's frayed and broken we don't know how many strands are broken inside if there's any but we do know that we've got a possible situation there that is gonna invite corrosion and connection if it's got an open place on it. And eventually it's gonna be a problem with it within that starting. So take care of that. Obviously that's one of those visual inspections there that you can see without doing a great deal of, of other work. You want to replace that cable immediately because it will, it, there's not a possibility there will be a situation of corrosion and connection there at some point in time. Hey, Gail, we've got yeah. one question that goes with this. Um, Dan asks, so is excessive corrosion on the battery terminals indicative of broken strands in the battery cable? No, the corrosion on the, on the post, et cetera, is going to be caused from various things like all the elements in the air, the the high humidity, so much moisture in the air, salt in the in the air, all of those types of things, corrosion can, and also because of the chemical element surrounding a battery in, inside the post and and uh, on the post, you have lead, and it's very much like copper. What attracts uh, corrosion the most? A good a good uh, connection and or a good uh, capability to allow current through it. We've all seen that where we have a copper penny and we put it on a battery. What's it going to do? It's going to corrode. Copper is a good conductor. Well, lead is a good conductor and it will allow corrosion to come on, on it from different components and, and situations. Yeah, and corrosion is a normal process. As, it is. As we talked about earlier, it's the result of electrolysis. There yeah. you go. Absolutely. That that situation of of scenarios around the cables and connections around post. Uh, when once we put the clamp on, it's always suggested, recommended that you seal that with something. There was a lot of different ones out on the market today, but that you seal that once you put the cable on and you seal that from the outside air on the post and the cable connection there helps a great deal on that corrosion on the battery. But corrosion on the battery is, is going to be somewhat of a normal situation, not indicative of there being a cable problem. All right. Jeff, why don't you take us through this? I will. So as you guys can see by the uh, the picture that we've got illustrated here, you got a lot of corrosion within these cables. And, you know, that's things that, uh, you know, you can kind of spot with your eye if you're actually looking around and just, you know, checking. Um, so these are things that we really want to make sure we're getting replaced. Um, this electrical tape is not going to take care of that. You know, you're going to end up having to put a new cable on it. So just look for those signs that uh, there could be an issue that is causing these, these codes that keep popping up, whether it's a low voltage code or, you know, um, injector issue or whatever. Let's, let's make sure we're actually looking at what is really causing the problem itself. So look for the uh, eyelet connectors, um, look for any strands that look like they might be broken or frayed. Um, and, you know, something that we've always seen, you know, here in Texas a lot is uh, varmints, critters, whatever you want to call them, that actually get in and start gnawing on wires. For some reason, they like wires. We haven't figured that out yet. Um, but look for things that are very obvious to, uh, to be able to check, make sure it's right when you do the fix and it's fixing it right the first time. So look for corrosion or even look for any heat. Um, so if you've got some of these uh, coverings that are actually looking kind of bulged up or um, 
look like they've got some kind of cancer on them or something. This could be a case of where corrosion has actually got underneath that uh, um, covering, the protective covering, and just started corroding and starting to build it out. So look for that. Look for, uh, you know, looking at the circuits themselves. You know, if you've got a code that's leading you on this path, uh, make sure you're looking at all the circuits within that because, you know, you could be blowing a fuse and we don't want to put a bigger fuse in there. You know, that's not going to fix the problem. We've got guys that'll actually want to put a, uh, a 20 amp fuse in one that's blowing a five amp. Well, let's figure out what's causing the five amp because that circuit was designed for that type of fuse. So let's not try to uh, mix in something that's going to cause a bigger problem. Look for corrosion at any of your grounding points. Now, I know our illustration here has got us probing into that wire. We were always taught if you probed into a wire because you couldn't get in there to test anything, if you had to probe it, you need to seal it off. So whether you're using silicone or, you know, some kind of sealant, whether it's super glue, anything that's going to protect that from getting any moisture inside, um, do that. So that way you're, you're not opening yourself up for another repair down the road. Uh, that's not fixing it right the first time. So Jeff, I just, we got a, a comment, not a question from John Gernig in the audience. Sorry, I didn't mean to say your last name, that's but okay. <laughs> this may be something new for us. I don't know if you've heard this, but he says critters like wire insulation because most of it is soy based and it tastes sweet to them. Oh, I did not know that. I did not know that. Does he get a bell <laughs> for that? Do you ring the bell for, there you go. Awesome. Um, yeah, also... we've seen quite a few of those before. There was a question on a previous slide. Um, we may see if we can go back to that. How does putting your digital multimeter on a positive post and then the positive at the starter show voltage on your meter like in the last picture? I think that he's talking about slide 13, John. You can click over to that. If, if that doesn't make sense, then. Yes. One of the things, if I could enter in here, one of the things that, that that has a tendency to take people and go, how does that happen? Well, remember, we're checking the, we have current going through that cable, correct? And so I, times R, there's resistance within that cable because of the broken strands, will always equal voltage in that situation. I times R equals E. And so what we're placing that voltmeter across there, multimeter, is so we can determine how much loss between point A and point B, and it will happen every time. And we're even going to show that. We're going to confuse you more here in just a few moments and put, put that on the ground side. So we're yep. checking ground to ground. That sometimes is very confusing to folks, but remember we're isolating that cable as we go through it. Current times resistance equals voltage. And another thing, Jeff, that I was taught many, many years ago as a young fellow, so that's how long it's been, is always look for butt connectors. That's, that means somebody else has been there and they have created a, a pro possible problem on two ends of that, that butt connector. Because yes, sir. Allowing it to come in corrosion connection because of oxidation, because of uh, various things. Uh, can cause those butt connectors to really, you can't see it because, but somebody has bypassed something and or created a butt connector, cut it, cut the wire, put a butt connector in there, didn't seal it, didn't silicone it. And that's one of the first things to look for. Yeah, and Kyle, it's, it's good that uh, they brought that question up because uh, the guy that works for me in the lab, uh, been an auto mechanic for over 20 years, was like, that's not possible. Yes, it's possible. You're looking at a voltage drop, a voltage loss. So yeah, great question that came up. That's good. But as Gail just alluded to, this is how you're looking for a drop and it's all part of Ohm's law. So that takes you back into the old school uh, testing process. Absolutely. And now, as we move forward on this though, so John, if you wanna uh, advance, so we can also do this if you got to, if we do have some of these truck mechanics on here. You can also do that within your uh, battery banks that you're working off of. So you can actually run parallel connection on these things just to see exactly and make sure because as we look at some of our new tractor trailers that are coming out, some of these has got what we call bus bars. 
So it's not a cable that's running uh, across from each battery. So, you know, some have two, some have three, some have four. You've got this big long bus bar that go across. Well, you can actually get corrosion on some of those too, which can actually create a voltage drop at the battery as well. So once again, you're using your voltmeter and you're going across and it's, you know, you've got already uh, the unit running. So look for these voltage drops on the negative side on the cables just to make sure, and you can do it on the positive side as well, because you may run into a situation as Gail pointed out in one of the earlier slides where there could be corrosion or broken strands within this wire that you're not able to see. If you run just a continuity test, well, heck yeah, you know, like Gail said, if you got two strands, you're still gonna pick it up. You're gonna get that beeping. Well, let's make sure that we're actually doing a true voltage drop test and let's check the cables out for sure to make sure we are doing our due diligence on fixing the problem. Now, if you've got something that's, uh, you know, within a cable, it's three tenths of a volt loss. What you need to do is take the cables off, clean them very good, clean the surface that they're gonna be connected against and then put everything back together and check it again. Uh, this could be something that, uh, you know, just over time with this corrosion factor and, you know, lead is gonna corrode sooner or later. Uh, this is something that periodically you do have to break them down and clean them. Uh, same in the RV industry, you got a bank of batteries, you end up doing that periodically as well. You've got to make sure that you've got a path of least resistance for these things to operate and operate correctly. We have one question that's sort of related to this, uh, but Gordon asks, he works for a heavy duty truck OEM. They use heavy duty 24 volt batteries and they were told by their, <clears throat> excuse me, by their warranty center that four batteries never fail at the same time. So they can't claim for re replacement of all batteries, even if their test, they can exactly. do a test. What yep. are your thoughts on that? He's exactly right. And so, you know, one of the things that you do run into, and especially when you've got a, uh, a manager that is all about saving dollars. So we do not like to replace just one battery out of a four bank, because what happens when you put that new battery in with these batteries that let's say are three years old, that new battery is going to basically equalize itself down to those. So those three-year-old batteries, this brand new battery is gonna get equalized down to that because they're in a parallel system. So they're gonna equalize themselves down. Now, with him talking about a 24 volt system, uh, that's kind of going back to old school because it used to be a 1224. Uh, 12 volt runs the system itself on all the electronics, but when you go to crank, it was off the 24 volt. So you did have that type scenario. And we totally understand, you know, and us being on not wanting the warranty side of batteries, uh, we can't warranty all four of them if you've only got one that's bad. So we, we totally get that. But just keep in mind that um, that new battery that you put into that system with those old batteries, it will equalize itself down to those type capacities of the other batteries. You're exactly right, Jeff. You know, all four batteries are not going to go bad at the same time. And there may be one that's causing that is a culprit and causing the entire group not to work for a function properly, but they will not warranty, but just that one that's bad. The other one, the other ones may be used batteries. They may be something you can pair those up on another truck or whatever, but it's a situation where all four are not going to fail at the same time. What are the odds? Yeah, exactly. All right, thanks. Let's let's jump into fundamentals. More fundamentals. Fundamentals. Oh, you put the fun in fundamentals, guys. Let me just say. Yeah. That. Yes. One of the things that we're looking at here is we're using a generic pictorial, if you will, of the batteries, solenoid, starter motor, uh, some type of connection between those, the alternator, etc., and we're showing a generic picture of an engine there and the frame rail that's going. Uh, that's the body frame. And so we're looking at that. And so the elements we're going to be looking at, obviously, is voltage or the positive side and the ground side. So when we look at, go more in depth with this situation, uh, always, always start to check all of the conditions or all the cables connections here. And we're going to go through a, 
a scenario here in just a few moments of showing how to check each and every one of those type scenarios. Uh, voltage drop testing is very fundamental, but at the same time, it's very much like the individual asked a while ago, how can you get a voltage loss between both positive to positive? And that's going back to Ohm's law, but check the primary grounds. Grounds are frequently a cause of problems and we can we can search and search and search and it's in a grounding type situation. So in this case, let's go from the negative post again and take our volt meter and go from the negative post and then go to the engine block itself to a good metal surface on the engine block. And then what are we gonna do? We're gonna place current on all the cables and connections. That means start the engine. While we're starting the engine, we're seeing how much loss we have between that positive post on the ground. It's going from the battery to the engine ground frame rail to the engine itself and or through a cable or connection directly to the engine. And so we're testing that. And so we're going to check it under dynamic situation. That means in its normal scenario, and that's putting current through it and going ground to ground. And also on the other one, ch chassis ground, you know, that frame rail or that body of that vehicle is also connected to the negative post of the battery. So it becomes a ground that a lot of the cables and connections from the circuit boards of circuit boards or computer boards of anything that's electric, electrical, like the, the lights, the uh, radio mop, possibly different things are gonna be connected to the body ground in that situation. So we have to also check that to make sure, you know, as we were looking at those connections on the ground side that were corroded that Jeff was talking about, that's where these come in. And oftentimes I have a bad situation that will affect a lot of anything that's connected to the body itself. So it's very good to also check again from that post to that chassis ground to get your fundamentals over with, to let you give yourself a yes or no answer on making sure that these are correct. And we're getting one tenth of a volt, so we know under load, so we know that they're good in this scenario. So next we would illustrate, uh, the next slide we would illustrate going to look at uh, other scenarios in this case uh, as an example and jeff is this yours or mine I think it oh, is <laughs> okay i would just turn it over to you jeff <laughs> so we're going to look at the uh, the voltage loss here from the positive side of the battery over to the uh, b pillar on the uh, alternator we do understand that a lot of these alternators are hid and it's hard to get to in there to check uh, but there are still abilities where you can actually get in there and check it out just to see. So once you can get to it and, and hopefully you're not probing into it, um, get in there and uh, crank the engine up, rev it up to about, you know, 1,000, 1,500 RPMs and turn on the accessories. And what we want to look for is just kind of any, any drops off of the voltage side uh, on the positive or even on the ground side. So we know in this case, we're at two tenths of a volt. So we know that that's, that's still normal. Uh, under SAE standards, so we're still good on this one. Now, as we move into the uh, the next slides, we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about how we uh, how we do this uh, live. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna start out and kind of walk through the process of checking uh, checking for uh, voltage drops in the cables. Now, make sure you're doing this in the cables. So we're gonna start out with just looking at battery voltage. So we'll put our probes across the battery itself. We're looking at 12.76 right now. And we do have a little bit of load that it's actually kind of recovered from. So this is what we're doing here. Then we're gonna go step over to checking out the cable itself. So Ray, if you wanna go ahead and start it up. So we're way way in good on these because what we were looking for was looking for a 0.3 or below so you can see we're 0.005 so that's great from there let's go over and check out the ground to the frame of the car itself and see where we're at 
So once again, we're still good because we're at 0.0064. Now, I'm gonna go to the alternator and look at the ground here. So I'm gonna go to the housing of the alternator and we're still well within it. It's 0.03 to 04. So wonderful there. Now let's go to the starter. And I'm looking at the starter and we're still 0.0344. So we're still well within the bounds of what SAE standards are. Now notice yep. we did that on the, uh, the positive, uh, or excuse me, on the negative side. You can actually do it on the positive as well. You know, we were just doing this for you guys for kind of a reference point as to looking to see how much loss do we have. Now, of course, as you guys can tell, this was a pretty, pretty pristine vehicle. So we would, we would expect nothing less from this car. But you are going to run into situations where you are going to have a higher uh, voltage drop. And from there, you're going to have to start diagnosing, going in and looking at all the wires, seeing where they're uh, traveling to, make sure your grounds are all in good uh, good, good connections, no corrosion buildup, no breaks. Uh, so that way, at least you are doing due diligence for the consumer themselves. That answers the one of the questions we have from Randy. It said, is the limit for ground voltage drop the same as positive? And you're, you're saying it is. Yep, yep, yep. High current. Cool. All right. So, Gail, I think on this one, we're, we're really going to blow some people's minds. Am I correct? We probably are in this situation. On the next slide, we're looking at the scenario you oh, covered. Oh, wait. That's a surprise. That's oh, right, right. <laughs> Before we go to that next slide, we have one little reminder for you guys. Um, John, if you could go back. We have a, a giveaway in this, in this pro clinic, if you would. All we're asking is for you to complete the five question survey that you're going to see at the end of this. Um, we're almost done. We've got a couple really one more slide. And then we're going to take a few questions here and any more that you want to send in. But uh, again, if you if you can take a minute to answer the, the questions that we have, uh, you'll see them pop up on your screen as soon as we hit end on this uh, on the uh, pro clinic. Um, if you'll answer those five questions for us, you'll be entered to win a, uh, this uh, mini helmet autographed by Kyle Bush uh, of Joe Gibbs Racing. So that's all. Thanks. Keep going, guys. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Again, we're showing this slide and we're showing multiple voltmeters or multimeters in this situation, in fact, four. And so this is a situation where you need to go to the store and buy four different multimeters. No, not really. I'm just kidding. <laughs> we're showing a composite or summary of what we've shown and talked about doing voltage drop measurements. Very, very, very important. Can't stress it, cannot stress it too much in this situation. This is a troubleshooting scenario that you're going to, when you start learning to utilize this, you're gonna pat yourself on the back because you're gonna find problems that you never would have found. You're gonna find problems that the other shops cannot find, believe me. So remember we started off with showing what the SAE recommended voltage drops were. So these are maximum, this is maximum criteria. <coughs> for high current and low current. <laughs> Pardon me, guys. Situation. And so we we see the one, two, and 0.1 to 0.3 types of scenario. And this, we're going through a scenario. We're check, we talked about checking across the battery, but we talked about doing a, a positive to positive at the alternator going from the alternator itself, checking the ground of the alternator, et cetera. So in this situation, we're showing a positive summary of different things of voltage drops that we have already talked about and just reiterating those. So this is very important. Again, I can't overemphasize that. This is one of those fundamental things that we is often overlooked and can find problems where those other shops have overlooked themselves and you're, they're the you're the third shop they've come to trying to fix this problem that they have that keeps reoccurring. So voltage drops can help you find that. So one of the things, I think we have a question here, correct? Yeah, so we're looking at uh, our voltmeter number question? one is okay. showing 14.6 at the alternator. Voltmeter two is showing pulling two tenths of a volt. And then on our other, on the ground side, we're showing 0.10 tenth of a volt drop. 
but now our voltmeter on number four is blank. It's got a big question mark. So what should our battery voltage be? And that's a great question, Jeff. It kind of goes back to, hey, let's do the voltage drops and let's test these things. And then what should we have across the battery from at this situation? Now, remember, we've got 14.6 at the uh, alternator. So are we getting... We're getting answering? some answers. Yeah, we're getting some answers. I'm gonna we're gonna give everybody a few more minute or a few more seconds to answer it. Um, while we while we do that, we had a couple questions that are a little. Well, let me one's a little off topic. Let me go to this one. Uh, Don asks. Oh, it's more of a comment. Now let me go to this one. Tim asks: Are butt connectors that you heat seal with solder acceptable for connection? They're much much better because they heat seal in that scenario and especially if they have heat shrink wrap around those to seal it from the outside. So yes, you're correct in that situation. I'm talking about the, when I was talking about butt connectors earlier, I was talking about the old style that somebody, they go to a shop and they, they cut that wire and they put that old type butt connector that's open at each end and maybe they didn't clamp it well. Maybe they, it's been a while and corrosion or connection has, but those that have solder and or seal that from the outside elements is much better. All right. Um, so John, do you have our poll results now? Okay. Most people gave it a 14.3. We had a few and answer 14.0 and 13.0 and one answered 15.3. Well, the correct you know. answer is the 14.3. So the 86% yeah. are right. So y'all get a pat on the back. Yes, pat your step on the back. <laughs> Absolutely, if your arm can reach that far. Yeah, we'll give you a, a digital virtual pat on the back. Yes. Right. <laughs> um, then, uh, Okay, here's here's a couple other comments. Uh, James says, I think the crimp connectors with shrink wrap work good. Sounds good, right? Right. All right. Um, and he said, uh, Ted says, do you do, asks, do you do the voltage drop testing with the engine running? Yes. Yes. Yes, and or starting. During the starting cycle, if you're going to the, to the engine or starter uh, type situation to solenoid from the battery, it would be a start type situation because that's the kind of current that you normally have when you're starting that to go to the solenoid and or the starter itself. That's during starting only or should be. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, let's jump into our Q and A. We've got a lot of questions, folks. If you want to put those in, we're going to, we typically try to hang on here, hang on the line as long as we can get those answered. Um, Gerardo asks if there would be a PDF of this and yes, that's one of our five questions in our short survey after this. Just, you can say yes or no. If you'd like a copy of this presentation, we'll send it to you. Um, Bill says, very helpful. Appreciate your time do, going over this. You're welcome, Bill. Um, Paul says, according to AAC, positive side voltage drop not, should not, uh, positive side voltage drop not exceed 0.02 volt and negative side voltage drop not exceed 0.01 volt. It's point one and point two. Okay. All right. One tenth and instead of 01, 01, 01. would be point oh one would be a hundred. Okay. All right. Um, I have a couple questions that are a little off topic, but we're gonna get to them if we can. Um, Don made a comment, and I think this is kind of talking about diagnosing a problem. He says components and cables don't use voltage that is needed for the circuit. Is that Makes sense to you? Well, when you have a voltage drop, you're gonna decrease the amount of voltage going to that component. And then that component can't function correctly if that's what we're getting at. Right. Not positive what he meant by that, but sounds like a good answer. Yes. Um, Ray had a question. He says, you've been talking about voltage drops in relation to resistance and current pathways between battery positive to battery negative. Is there, can there be a voltage drop associated to the battery that is unable to provide the current demanded of the circuit? For example, internal battery resistance values. 
Well, yes, there can be a weak battery. That's one of the things you need to check first or in the process is checking the battery. That's that's one of the fundamentals is check the battery with a with a conductance tester, with a load tester, whatever it is that you test batteries with, check to make sure that the battery itself has enough strength or conductance to be valid in what you're testing. Absolutely. Yep. All right. Um, then um, an anonymous attendee, mysterious attendee, asks, can you explain the answer? Like, go over the answer to our poll question, our, our pop quiz here. Oh, oh absolutely. Jeff, you want to take that one? Yeah, so when you're looking at the alternator itself, I mean, this is where you're generating your voltage and amperage, you know, output. So as we're looking at this, we're looking at the alternator itself producing that 14.6. Well, now you've thrown resistance into the play where we're looking at voltage drops back to the battery itself, whether it be on the ground side or on the positive side. So you are going to have that voltage loss. It's almost like when you're looking at a, uh, and I'll throw this big example out there, tractor trailers where a lot of the, uh, the batteries themselves now, the manufacturers will put a voltage sense lead at the battery itself. And the reason for that is the alternator itself, if you don't have a voltage sense lead, it's not, it's going to regulate what it's there at the alternator itself. So, and in this case, we're doing 14.6. Well, by the time I get back to the battery itself, I've got a voltage drop in there. So this is where we're calculating that up off the ground and off the positive side, looking at voltage drops in general. So you'll never have that same voltage from the or directly at the alternator at the battery itself, unless you have a voltage sense lead at the uh, battery. And that's, so your alternator is still gonna be outputting more to be able to keep up with where, where that voltage sense leads at. So in this case, you will have that voltage drop of three tenths getting back exactly. there to it. Exactly, Jeff. Well explained. Good job. 14.6 minus the two tenths minus the other one tenth on the ground side. 14.6 minus 0.2 and 0.1 is 14.3. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, question from Paul. What is the voltage drop specs for the starter system negative and positive? And that goes back to on our SAE situation. Typically what you're going to get is two tenths of a volt or loss or less in a good scenario. But if it starts to exceed three tenths of a volt during cranking, you've got corrosion connection, bad cable, et cetera, that's causing that scenario and, and or something you need to isolate. Either corrosion at the post of the connection, a post of the battery and or the cable or connection. Okay. Um, Gerardo says, is any amp probe, well, he says, is any amp probe for recommendations? I'm wondering if there's any amp probe you recommend. That may be the question. We use a variety, Jeff. What? Yeah, I mean, we've got clamp-on inductive amp meters is what we've got. Um, we use a TPI unit, but Fluke's got them out there. It's, you know, the more accurate, the more the unit cost. Yeah, you know, that's it depends on how much you want to spend. It's, yeah, it's very because much. If you're looking like, at getting, if you're looking at getting in down to the uh, the milliamps, then your finite, the more finite that you get, the higher that unit is going to cost you. So if you look at key off drains, yeah, you're probably going to pay a quite a bit of pennies on this thing for it. Yeah, um, and we keep getting this question, but I'll uh, I'll just remind everybody if you if you fill out the survey, one of the questions is you'll get a copy of this presentation, which has that. SAE recommended volt drop chart, but you'll also get a PDF if you say you want it, a PDF of this pro, of our pro clinic manual for this section. This section will be coming and that'll probably come out next week. Um, so just make sure you uh, answer the survey. Uh, what is the normal range of voltage drop from the alternator output to the battery terminal positive? Oh, the B plus of the alternator to the B plus or positive cable of the battery? Is that what they're asking? Yeah. What is yes. the, I think that's the question. Yes. Well, remember that you're going through this procedure. You've got the vehicle running. You're running it, uh, the RPMs up to 1,000 or 1,500, and you're turning on all loads. You're making that alternator work, function like it should under heavy load. So it's, uh, it's having to output current for the AC working, the 
lights, the all the various things that are on on that vehicle. So it's having to put out a fairly good bit of, of current. So at that point, you should never have more than three tenths of a volt loss between the positive B plus of that alternator and the positive lead or the positive post of that battery. Cool. All right. Well, those are the questions we have that are on topic. We have a couple that are um, other things we've talked about in other pro clinics. If you guys uh, care to attend those, you'll hear these addressed. Um, and those are on interstatebatteries.com slash pro clinic. Uh, but Joe asks, Joseph asks, is battery registration and coding necessary on newer vehicles? Yes. Yes. Jeff. Yes. Jeff uh, knows and it's a great very, very that. important. Uh, the reason behind that is, so a lot of uh, manufacturers have gone to basically looking at amper hours out and amper hours back in. So they're monitoring all these circuits uh, through the computer itself, and it regulates the alternator to be able to uh, detect when the battery is losing capacity, and it, that does it through that calculation in there. So it'll actually change the charging curve uh, through the alternator. So when you go back with a new battery, the battery registration is there for a reason. Uh, it's going to tell the system itself that you just incorporated or put a new battery in there. And when you look at coding, if you're looking at like amper hours, uh, let's say you've got a, a battery that came out that's 100 amper hour. Well, the one that you're putting back in, it's same physical size, group size and all, but it's 110 amper hours. Well, you need to let the system know that. And that's how you do it by coding, whether it's with a QR reader or whether it's going in and uh, entering the, uh, the uh, number off the battery itself for 70, 80, 90, 100, 110 amper hours. So it's very, very important because it starts the calculation process again. It starts off as new. So what you'll run into if you don't register the battery as new to the computer or you don't code it correctly, this will throw off the, uh, the charging system. And what can typically happen, and we know this because we've, we've heard a lot of shops complain about it, uh, it can take out the alternator, the computer, and it'll also take out your new battery. Now, you know, you hear a lot of uh, rumbling out there about, you know, the different dealerships, whether it be BMW, Mercedes, whomever, saying, you know, you got to have our battery in there. Well, that's not necessarily true. So uh, make sure that you're, you're replacing the, uh, the correct battery with the, you know, the right OE specifications, and you are doing the due diligence on either putting the correct uh, amper hour code in there and, you know, vendor, whoever it is, Varda, uh, Clarios, whomever, uh, and you're doing the, the correct battery registration. Because if you don't, these things will come back and haunt you. And it typically comes back from the dealership side. I mean, if you're an independent shop, you'll typically have the customer calling you from a dealership saying, well, you put the wrong battery in it. And that's not, that's not true. So just be aware of that. Awesome. Okay. That's absolutely right, Jeff. And that's a good explanation. I had a situation recently of a guy calling me and he had placed a uh, battery in that was actually the wrong size. And instead of a hundred amp hour battery, he had placed an 80 amp hour battery. And so he didn't let it know that. So obviously it, the alternator still thinking I've got a hundred amp hour battery. And so it's overcharging. It's, putting too much current it looking at how much is being taken out and trying to fill that up to 120% or whatever. And it's overcharging that battery. Cool. Uh, well, we, we need to wrap it up because we got a lot of people waiting for the survey to pop up so they can request this. Um, one last question. If the battery is not fully charged at time of checking alternator voltage, this is from Jeremy, mm -hmm. can we assume the voltage will indeed be less than 14.6, especially with the newer vehicles and the computer controlled alternators? And that's possible. Yes. Um, you know, because the battery really needs to be fully charged and especially if it's set for a few days without being ran, uh, that key off drain is going to bring it down. So yeah, I mean, that that's possible. Um, but just just know that it, it's got to be built back up one way or another. Okay. Well, that's, that's all we have time for. Uh, we do have a couple more, but we'll have to answer them in email offline. But we want to thank everybody for attending. Jeff, thank you for putting the fun and fundamentals. And Gail, for putting the <laughs> mental and fundamentals. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank we you appreciate y'all being on the call. All right. Um, be, 
If you missed part of this, uh, just jump, jump, jump down in the last half. We're doing it again at, uh, I think, 2 o'clock. Jeff's got to go get his workout in, though. That's right. Uh, he gets fussy if you don't. But uh, we'll, we'll, um, we'll wrap this up. You'll see the survey pop up on your screen. If you answer it, we'd appreciate it. And we'll uh, see you for the next one. Take care. Thanks. Thanks.